Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello students, welcome to Swayam Prabha channel. I am Swati Solanki, Assistant Professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. I am taking up the course titled as White Collar Crimes and in today's session, we will be discussing the Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002, Part 3. The objective of today's session would be to discuss and analyze the provisions relating to survey, search and seizure, power to arrest, Presumption as to records of the properties, presumption in interconnected transactions, burden of proof, special courts, bail, and power of authorities to summon. Now, if we look at Chapter 5 of the Act, the heading says summons, searches, and seizures, etc. When we talk about criminal law, we do not see any other similar provision which talks about surveying within the relevant Act. Now, an analogy can be drawn in here where we see that under the Income Tax Act, the relevant investigating agency can make the survey to identify if the person has paid the due taxes or not. Similarly, under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, the investigating agency that is Directorate of Enforcement can make the survey and it derives the power to make such survey under section 16. In the previous session, we had read that under section 48, the enforcement directorate, the composition or who are the officers have been enumerated. Now, what is the purpose of doing this survey? When enforcement directorate is doing the audit trail, they have to go through the necessary relevant documents to know if the property has been generated from the commission of the schedule offence. When I say property, it would include both the movable or immovable property. So when enforcement directorate is doing the survey, basically they are investigating into these papers, they are identifying the relevant documents and then they are marking those documents. We can see on the slide that on the basis of material in his possession, in the possession of the enforcement directorate, such material indicates either received along with the complaint, authorities may have also sourced such material from banking companies, financial institutions and intermediaries being reporting entity by taking recourse to section 12A from the records specified in section 12. Now, when we discuss this point, it is pertinent to note that when we talk about Section 12, the reporting entities could be, for an instance, banking entity which is required to maintain the record of the transaction between the client and the, the entity enumerated under 11 of the PML Act. Now, such record has to be preserved for a period of five years from the date of the transaction between the client and the entity. Now, let's say when this bank come across any transaction which appears to be doubtful transaction, immediately the banking company will inform the financial intelligence unit, which is the national agency working for collating of the data from various different business entities. Now, what will happen? The financial intelligence unit further inform the enforcement directorate that this transaction appears to be doubtful and this must be investigated into by the investigating agencies under the PMLA Act. Now, what if this entity does not maintain the record for the period of five years? Is there any penal provision which penalizes this banking entity? The answer is yes, and that is section 13, subsection 2, which provides if such data is not being maintained for the set period of five years, then 
punishment in the form of fine can be imposed which shall not be less than 10,000 but which may extend to 1 lakh rupees. Now when we look at that this director or deputy director should have reason to believe whether it is just a mere suspicion or it is founded upon some sufficient or relevant piece of evidence. So this is just not a doubt that can arise on whims and fancies of the enforcement directorate. There has to be material evidences which are available before the ED. The meaning of reason to believe can be seen or can be picked from the IPC section 26 which says sufficient cause to believe that thing not otherwise that offence of money laundering is committed and it has to be taken down into writing. Now, ED has the power to make the survey, but we have territorial jurisdiction as well. So, wherever the limit of the area has been specified, the relevant officer working in that area can make the survey. Now, as I said, the purpose of this survey is to investigate, identify and mark the relevant documents. In a way, we are providing the assistance to the investigating agency. In what form? Please have a look. Seek assistance from the proprietor, employee or any other person to inspect the records, checks and verify the transaction and furnish any other information incidental thereto. Now, whatever material information has been collected by the enforcement directorate, they will have to further send it to the adjudicating authority under section 16 subsection 2. Now, what is being done during the survey? Marks of identification on the records, inventory can be made and the statement of any person present there can be recorded. So, this has been provided under section 16 subsection 3. Now, taking the discussion further, section 17 talks about search and seizure. But before we get into the ingredients or the relevant provision, it is important for us to first understand the key terms which are seizure, confiscation and freezing. When we talk about seizure, it is the temporary restraint that can be put on an asset or which is to be taken into custody by those who are making the investigation or inquiry. For an instance, if we are looking at the vehicle or a car which may have been purchased utilizing the proceeds of crime, it will be impounded by the investigating agency. Now, these measures which are taken in the context of seizure, please look at the latter part of this definition which has been provided by UNOCD 2004. It says generally these measures are used to temporarily prevent the movement of assets pending the outcome of the case. So, what we want to do that we want to protect these assets till the time the court takes the cognizance whether it has been involved, there is prima facie evidences available which suggest that till that time it will be temporarily restrained to be utilized by the person. Now, when we refer to confiscation, confiscation means permanent deprivation of assets by the order of a court or a competent authority. Now, in this case, when we talk about what happens under the proceedings of PMLA, enforcement directorate when provisionally attaching any proceed of crime, they are not taking that proceed of crime into their possession. Rather, they will just notify that this property stands provisionally attached and it is to be then confirmed by the adjudicating authority. Now, Till this time of adjudication proceeding, the enforcement directorate will not dispossess the person, they will not uh, drive out the persons living in that property until the conclusion of the trial is being done by the special court in the money laundering case. So, confiscation takes place only if the trial under money laundering act results into conviction. Then the property stands confiscated in the name of the central government. We also discussed this in the previous session. Now then comes freezing. What do we mean by freezing? Freezing means restraining any transaction or dealing in property. Now freezing is a concept wherein there is temporarily suspension of rights over the assets pending the outcome of the case. 
Now imagine a scenario that this person had generated the proceeds of crime and he has by following the process of layering after 10 years or so he then deposited this amount into a bank account. Now ED must secure this amount which is kept in the bank account of the person. Now ED cannot take into its possession that amount physically. So what will be done? The enforcement directorate will direct this relevant bank that the account stands frozen and this person will no longer be allowed to deal with the bank account making any transaction whatsoever. Now when we talk about this aspect there are two views. One view is that that because it is very difficult to trace the actual proceeds of crime the first time when the person had brought the proceeds of crime into the fin legitimate financial system whatever money is being reflected in the bank account that is attached by the ED. The people who have been the target of ED contends that ED unnecessarily harass us wherein we are innocent individuals, we had nothing to do, we were not involved directly or indirectly in the process of money laundering and therefore this provision is unjust. What we need to understand that it becomes very difficult for us to identify that which part of money is your legitimate money and which part of money is your tainted money. So they say that let's say this person is running a business wherein he has to pay salary to his employees. In such a scenario the other view is this that these people are now being prevented for making the salaries to their employees. Why? Because all their bank accounts have been frozen by the enforcement directorate. The example in this point is being reflected on the slide. Let's suppose X has committed fraud and generated 50 crores. Now those are proceeds of crime. The funds are then deposited in the name of his company ABC Limited. Subsequently ABC enters into five different transactions with five different shell companies and deposits 10 crore to each of these companies. Now what has been done here? Now go back to the first session where we talked about smurfing which is one of the ways by which the money can be introduced into the legitimate financial system. So what has been done? The huge amount of money has been deposited in the name of the company and now it has been broken into smaller amount of transactions wherein into five different companies the amount has been trans transferred. Now these companies do not exist in reality but they are just existing on the piece of paper to siphon the money. And let's say after some time the amount which were deposited in these five different shell companies at once being collected and transferred to person Y who happens to be the son of the X who owned ABC Limited. So what this person has done, he has tried to project this money as if this is his white money. So how ED investigates? ED will come after Y, then it will come after all the five different shell companies and ultimately to Y. So when we talk about this amount is deposited in the name of Y, ED can freeze the bank account of the person belonging to Y. Now from where does ED derives this power? ED derives this power under the ambit of section 17. Now this is the overview of section 17 starting from this point. Let's say when we look at what is the purpose of 17 for impounding the records, freezing and seizure of the assets. As discussed in the previous session, we said that under section 5, enforcement directorate has the power to provisionally attach the immovable property and under section 17 we refer to the movable property which may also be in the form of any records or documents or in the form of the account. Now this director or deputy director as authorized in this behalf, if he believes that there are sufficient material evidences which indicate that this person is in the possession of the proceeds of crime or he has dealt with the proceeds of crime in any manner, what they will do?
uh, they can conduct the search of those documents kept in any premises. Now, when we look further, once the uh, records have been seized by the enforcement directorate, immediately they will send the report to the adjudicating authority in the manner prescribed. Now, when the enforcement directorate is doing the search, how they are able to identify that this document needs to be impounded by them? It is the next step after the survey is completed. We just discussed that part. Now, when we talk about what happens thereafter, after following all the procedure under this relevant section 17, that enforcement directorate from the day of that seizure will have to send the report within 30 days to the adjudicating authority for the retention of those documents or records or any account. So what we are saying here that the adjudicating authority needs to confirm whatever has been seized or impounded or frozen under section 17. Lastly, you can see on the top that section 17 subsection 1 clause F gives the power to the enforcement directorate to examine the person on oath who is found in the possession or control of the record or any other movable property. This has been done for the purpose of collection of evidences. Now let's get to subsection 1 and I read the director or deputy director has the reason to believe on the basis of information in his possession. Such reasons for belief have to be recorded in writing that any person has committed any act which constitutes money laundering or is in the possession of proceeds of crime involved in the money laundering or is in possession of any records relating to the money laundering or is in possession of any property related to the crime. So when we talk about property in here we are referring to the assets. Then subject to the rules made in this behalf he may authorize any officer subordinate to him to enter and search any building, place, vessel, vehicle or aircraft where he has read reason to suspect that such records or proceeds of crime are being kept. Second, if the property is sealed, they can break open the lock of any door, box, locker, safe, almira or other, other receptacle for exercising the powers conferred by clause A where the keys thereof are not available. They may seize any record or property found as a result of such search. Place marks of identification on such record or property if required or make or cause to be made extracts or copies therefrom. Where you cannot physically take the records, what you will do? You will make the copies or extract of those records. Make a note of an inventory of such record or property. Examine on oath any person who is found to be in possession or control of any record or property in respect of all matters relevant for the purposes of an investigation under this act. So what we are looking here that you have to make the inventory. Why do we do this? Because after making the inventory on the piece of paper, it is to be shown to the person and the person will put his signature. Now what is interesting to note in here is that, that there was one proviso before the Finance Amendment Act of 2019. Now this proviso provided that no, pers no search can be made unless right, a report has been forwarded against the person who is charged under the scheduled offence before the magistrate or the complaint has been filed against this person under the scheduled offence before the court or the magistrate. Now that was the essential safeguard which was available to the innocent individuals. That first ED must register scheduled offence against this person and in that case the charge sheet must be forwarded or the complaint is being made before the relevant case. Now what happens in this that when we say that this proviso has been deleted, that safeguard which was earlier available is no longer available. That means that now ED can make the search 
without having fulfilled those checks which were earlier there in the place. Now what happens here, the ED says that this was necessary because till the time they had to wait for the charge sheet to be filed, the person in the possession of these relevant documents or records which were necessary for the investigation and for the trial under the Money Laundering Act, they were being tempered with or the properties were being disposed of. Disposed of. So what was happening? All the relevant material was being destroyed by these people because of the time period that was taken for forwarding the charge sheet and filing the complaint. So in a way we can say and read that it has broadened the existing power of ED under the PMLA by bringing section 17 at par with section 19. Section 19 pertains to the arrest where there is no precondition to forward a report under section 173 of the CRPC. This report under 173 is the charge sheet or seek warrant from the court to make an arrest. Now this, the intent behind this has been to remove the difficulties that ED used to face. So what we have done, we have given more and more power to the ED to make the searches. Now moving forward under section 17A, previously we discussed the word freeze. The same has been provided under this provision. 17.1a empowers the ED to pass an order to freeze property where it is not practical to seize the same whereupon the property cannot be transferred or dealt with without prior permission of the officer making such order. Copy of freezing order is to be served on the person concerned that is the account holder. Now let's say uh, enforcement directorate has frozen some property or seized some property. Now we have to have some provision which authorizes this retention of the property or retention of the records with the investigating agency. Now in this regard one can refer to section 20 in the context of retention of the frozen property and section 21 in regard to the retention of the records under the PMLA Act. Now both the provisions are similarly worded and they say that the enforcement directorate can retain the records or the property respectively for the period of 180 days. Now if you are clear with what we discussed in section 5, one may say that the provisional attachment with regard to immovable property was also for the period of 180 days. Similarly, the retention of property or records under section 20 and 21 of the Act are allowed for the period of 180 days. Now what happens when the period of 180 days has already been expired, automatically they will have to release the records or the property. Now section 17.2 talks about that whatever you have seized, you will have to forward a copy of the reasons so recorded along with the material in possession refer to in that subsection to the adjudicating authority in the sealed envelope and the adjudicating authority shall keep such reasons and material for the prescribed period. Moving further, it is a provision which can be sought in the cases of emergency. Section 17.3 says, where an authority upon information obtained during survey under section 16 is satisfied that any evidence shall be or is likely to be concealed or tempered with, he may for the reasons to be recorded in writing, enter and search the building or place where such evidence is located or seize that evidence provided that no authorization referred to in subsection 1 shall be required for search under this subsection. Now when we talk about who are the people who can make the search under subsection 1, we see that the director or the deputy director who have been authorized. So even if deputy director has not been authorized under subsection 1, seeing the emergency of the situation, they can proceed under section 17.3. Now coming to the search of persons, this has been provided under section 18. Now 
in the previous pro provision we were talking about searching of any property the assets kept in any premises kept in, in any locker and so on and so forth in this provision we are talking about that we are searching the person right we are not searching the premises but we are searching the person now subsection one is similarly worded the key ingredients being that there has to be a reason to believe that reason to believe has been recorded in writing and who is the person who is authorized to make this search if an authority now which is this authority this authority is the authority mentioned in section 48 that is the enforcement directorate authorized in this behalf by the central government by general or special order has the reason to believe that any person has secreted about his person or in anything under his possession ownership or control any record or proceeds of crime which may be useful for or relevant to any proceedings under this act he may search that person and see such record or property which may be useful for or relevant to any proceedings under this act now let's say all the information is kept in a pen drive and this pen drive is in the pocket of the person so what we are searching the body of the person in here so in this case he is trying to conceal the records and these records are important for the purpose of investigation we can resort to subsection 1 of section 18 again proviso which was earlier there to subsection 1 stands deleted via 2019 finance amendment act to give more and more power to the enforcement directorate again subsection 2 is similarly worded what we saw under section 17 that whatever material you have acquired from the possession of this person within the sealed envelope it has to be forwarded to the adjudicating authority now when we look at in what manner this manner has been provided in the 2005 rules now when we are you know searching any person we can refer to subsection 3 where an authority is about to search any person he shall if the person if such person so requires take such person within 24 hours to the nearest gazetted officer superior in rank to him or to a magistrate now this is a statutory right right so the person let's say uh, someone who is below the rank of deputy director but he has been authorized in this behalf this person conducts the search he has to apprise the person whether you would like to be searched by the senior gazetted officer or before the magistrate if the person so requires this mandate has to be fulfilled now the proviso says the period for computing the 24 hours it, it shall exclude the time necessary for the journey undertaken to such per, to take such person to the nearest gazetted officer who is superior in rank to him continuing now if such requisition has been made under subsection 3 one must refer to subsection 4 the authority shall not detain the person for more than 24 hours prior to taking him before the gazetted officer superior in rank to him or the magistrate referred to in that subsection again similar proviso has been provided here in computing the period of 24 hours now let's say this person has been taken before the gazetted officer and he has sufficient reason to believe that this person is not involved in money laundering then the person can be forthwith discharged and this has been provided under subsection 5. Further subsection 6 says before making the search under subsection 1 or subsection 5 the authority shall call upon two or more persons to attend and witness the search and the search shall be made in the presence of such persons now when we look at this when we look at this subsection it basically provides the safeguard that no such person has been searched without following the process which is a due process in this case and it also lends credibility that search has been conducted by the enforcement directorate in a fashion which is provided under the act 
Subsection 7 talks about that authority will have to prepare the list of the things that have been recovered from the search of this person and the signature of the witnesses will also be taken on that list. Eighth, no female shall be searched by anyone except a female. Subsection 9, authority shall record the statement of person searched under subsection 1 or subsection 5 in respect of the records or proceeds of crime found or seized in the course of the search. Now let's say after everything has been completed in this search, now after this the enforcement directorate will have to send all the records within the period of 30 days. Now look at section 18 subsection 10. The authority seizing any record or property under subsection 1 shall within a period of 30 days from such seizure file an application requesting for retention of such record or the property before the adjudicating authority. So once again here we can sum up that under section 8 when we were referring to the adjudication the material had come before the adjudicating authority via section 5 subsection 5 or section 17 subsection 4 or section 18 subsection 10. So why we are forwarding all these records to the adjudicating authority? Because ED can retain such property movable, immovable or records only for the period of 180 days. And this section 18 or the other all these provisions tells us that within 30 days we have to send the records to the adjudicating authority. It only means one thing that the adjudicating authority must confirm such attachment within the period of 180 days. So let us say adjudicating authority passes this order on the 181th day that order will be invalid and it will have no force whatsoever. The person gets entitled to to have his property records back. Now coming to section 19 that talks about power to arrest. Now this is very very important and before we proceed it is important to underline this part. Now it is very important to know that when we talk about the code of criminal procedure at the time of the arrest, the police officer needs to communicate the grounds of arrest to the person who has been arrested. But if we look at here, the trends or judicial pronouncements indicated that even if there were no grounds of arrest, ED proceeded to arrest the person and when the person has challenged it that such arrest is illegal, we do not. We had various views that there is no such mandate wherein the accused needs to be provided with the grounds of arrest in writing. So in this regard, we have a recent judgment where Justice Bela Trivedi has said that when we look at the phrase as soon as may be under subsection 1, the grounds of arrest even though they may have been orally communicated to the person, they have to be supplied in writing within 24 hours. Why it was done? Because many a times the person would say who has been arrested that no grounds of arrest have been communicated to me. How would you prove if the ED has communicated the ground of arrest orally to them? So it was becoming very difficult to say that whether the mandate of constitutional obligation under Article 22 has been fulfilled or not. So lot of cases were falling outside the window. Now let's get to the ingredients. If the director, deputy director, assistant director or any other officer authorized in this behalf by the central government by general or special order has on the basis of material in his possession reason to believe and the reason for such belief has to be recorded in writing that any person has been guilty of an offence punishable under this act, he may arrest such person and shall, the word here is shall as soon as may be inform him of the grounds for such arrest. After that, then forward a copy of the order along with the material in his possession referred to in that subsection to the adjudicating authority in the sealed envelope. 
Now, every person who has been arrested under subsection 1 shall within the period of 24 hours is to be taken before the judicial magistrate or the metropolitan magistrate as the case may be having the jurisdiction. The proviso says for the purpose of computing 24 hours, the time necessary for the journey has to be excluded. The relevant case where I was referring to Justice Bela Trivedi is uh, Pankaj Pansal versus Union of India. In this case, the court has observed that how do we interpret the phrase as soon as may be and the court noted that since by a way of safeguard a duty is casted upon the concerned officer to forward a copy of order along with the material in his possession to the adjudicating authority immediately after the arrest of the person and to take person arrested to the concerned court within 24 hours of the arrest in our opinion the reasonably convenient or reasonably requisite time to inform the arrestee about the grounds of your arrest would be 24 hours of arrest. Now we have this judgment where the two judges bench have noted that now it is compulsory for the enforcement directorate to provide the grounds of arrest in the writing within 24 hours of making such arrest. Now why this is important? Now let's say someone who feels that he has been unnecessarily targeted and uh, there is no involvement of his in any of the process of money laundering, he would be then applying for the bail. Now, if he doesn't know on what grounds he has been arrested, how would he prepare his defense? So it becomes very important that this procedural safeguard, which is available in the ordinary criminal jurisprudence, is also be followed in this special legislation that is the PMLA Act. Now, when we talk about the presumption aspect, section 22 has to be referred. Presumption as to records or property in certain cases. Now, let's say some property is in your possession or some document is in your possession which bears your signature, it shall be presumed that they are your signature or it shall be presumed that property under your control belongs to you. Now, let's read. Subsection 1 records property found in possession or control of any person in the course of survey, search, where document is produced by any person under section 50, frozen, seized from the custody of any person, it shall be presumed that such records or property belong or belongs to such person. Now, this is the legal presumption that we are raising against this person. The contents of such, the content of such records are true that in handwriting of that very person and in a case of record stamped, executed or attested that it was duly have been so stamped, executed or attested by that very person. Section 23 is relevant in here. In our first session, we discussed that there can be transactions wherein it becomes very, very difficult that which transaction entails your white money and which transaction entails your black money. So the transactions are very, very complex. The presumption will be raised in those cases where the transactions are interconnected, that all the transactions are those transactions which can be labeled as the proceeds of crime. Now, again, we have to see whether it is a rebuttable presumption. The answer is yes. Let's read it. Where money laundering involved two or more interconnected transactions and one or more such transaction is or are proved to be involved in money laundering, then for the purposes of adjudication or confiscation under Section 8 or for the trial of money laundering offence, it shall unless otherwise proved to the satisfaction of the adjudicating authority or the special court be presumed that the remaining transaction from part of such inter transaction form part of such interconnected transactions. Now coming to the very important aspect that is the burden of proof as given under section 24 of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Now this provision as you see on the screen was amended in the year 2013 and it has two clauses clause A and clause B which provides 
in case of any person charged with the offence of money laundering under section 3, the authority or court shall, unless the contrary is proved, presume that such proceeds of crime are involved in money laundering. Now, when we refer to this part, it is referring to a person, a person who is charged with the offence of money laundering. That is the first ingredient. Second, that these proceedings are taking place either before the authority or the court. Now, what is this authority? This authority is the authority as mentioned under section 6, which does the adjudication proceedings under section 8. So, we are referring to the adjudication authority dealing with the civil proceedings of attaching the proceeds of crime. And then third, we are talking about the trial of money laundering that is taking place before the court. So, first is the person must be necessarily charged with the scheduled offence and then he is charged with the offence of money laundering. That is the first requirement. Second, that this burden of proof requirement or principle is relevant for the proceedings before the adjudicating authority under section 8 and for the trial in the money laundering under section 44 of the Act. It says and uses the word shall, unless the contrary is proved, presume that such proceeds of crime are involved in money laundering. Now, what is this legal presumption? Now, first let us understand the standard principle in the criminal jurisprudence. We must have seen that it is the prosecution who needs to prove the guilt of the accused beyond the reasonable doubt. Until then, the person will be presumed to be innocent. However, in this special legislation, once the prosecution has proved that this person is either in the possession of the proceeds of crime or he has been directly involved in the process of money laundering. So, in the first case, this person is simply in the possession of proceeds of crime or in the second case, he is directly or indirectly involved in the process of money laundering. In both the cases, the enforcement directorate have the material evidences which prima facie reveals that, that these assets are the proceeds of crime and then attaches the same. In such a case, this person will be presumed to be guilty that yes, you have committed the offence. Now, the burden of proof shifts upon you to disapprove this legal presumption which has been raised against you. Now, look at clause B. In the case of any other person, the authority or the court may presume that such proceeds of crime are involved in money laundering. So, we have just made a reference to two individuals, one who may be charged with section 3 of the PMLA and any other person. This can be a bona fide purchaser also. This any other person is in the possession of the property which looks like that as if they are the proceeds of crime. Now, when we talk about this person who is person A, let us name him person X. Against this person where the presumption will be raised, it will be raised under section 24 clause A which talks about the presumption is mandatory presumption because the word shall has been used. But when we talk about clause B where it is written in case of any other person, the word may has been used. Now, what is the difference between these two sub clauses? It is very important. Now, before 2013, there was no distinction which was made between whether we are referring to person X or we are referring to person Y. It simply provided that in relation to the proceedings under this act, unless the contrary is proved, it shall be presumed that such proceeds of crime are involved in money laundering. 
So no distinction was made that who is the person that we were dealing with. Now in the case of Vijay Madan Lal Chaudhary versus Union of India, it was been argued that section 24 is reversing the burden of proof and the standard is too high to meet. Now what was happening? That it was all the prosecution's case wherein this person was not getting anything on what grounds the assets have been attached, on what grounds he has been arrested. So he was not getting to know that why his property was being attached. And when we talk about that burden of proof in the unamended 2013, before 2013 Act, it was applicable to all the proceedings, meaning it was also applicable to the civil proceedings of attachment under Section 8. Now, this has been challenged in Vijay Madan Lal Chaudhary case, but the Supreme Court, Justice Khan Wilkar had said that this has been changed in the year 2013, wherein we have now two sub clauses and that distinction has to be maintained. First, second is that it is not the case of the reversal of burden of proof, rather it is the case of shifting the burden of proof upon the accused or upon the person who may fall under clause B. Now, how does this work? The courts noted that the prosecution must prove three important ingredients. One, that a criminal activity under the scheduled offence has been committed. That is the first threshold. Second, that the proceeds of crime have been generated by committing the criminal activity provided in that schedule. Third is that this person is directly or indirectly involved in getting those proceeds of crime generated, being generated from the scheduled offence in the PMLA Act. So until and unless the prosecution proves these three conditions, this legal presumption will not be raised against the accused under section 24 clause A. So this is the minimum requirement. So we do have other such legislations also where we say that prosecution needs to first prove one or two ingredients, then only the burden of proof shifts upon the accused. And because we are dealing with one challenging aspect that is the money laundering, the money generated is being used for terror financing, a hardened approach is being taken by the legislature when we deal with the PMLA. Now when we talk about the clause B here, so this is not the mandatory presumption. In this case where the adjudicating authority after giving the opportunity of hearing to this person under section 8 and referring to all the documents, adjudicating authority comes to the decision that this person appears to be the bona fide purchaser of the property and in no way he was involved in the proceeds of crime, the adjudicating authority will not raise this presumption against this any other person who may be in the possession of the property which was attached by the ED. So that distinction has to be maintained when we are referring to clause A and clause B. Now quickly moving to chapter 7 that is the special courts, uh, section 43 talks about the establishment of special courts wherein the matters of money laundering will be heard and these special courts will be established by the central government in consultation with the chief justice of the high court. Now when we talk about that in PMLA there are two things that are happening simultaneously, one is the scheduled offence and other is the offence of section 3. It is important to note that both the trials are not the joint trials but they are the separate trial. So when the trial court is hearing the matters, one of this and the other of this, what procedure they need to follow? Now subsection 2 to section 43 says, while trying an offence under this act, a special court shall also try an offence other than the offence referred to in subsection 1 with which the accused may under the code of criminal procedure be charged at the same time. So the person may be charged at the same time where the special court is hearing 
the matter under the section 3 of the PMLA. Now the trial before the special court has been provided under section 44. Now anyone who is punishable under section 4 and any scheduled offence connected to the offence under the section under that section shall be triable by the special court constituted for that area in which the offence has been committed. Provided that special court trying the scheduled offence before the commencement of this act shall continue to try such scheduled offence or the special court may upon the complaint made by an authority authorized in this behalf under this act take cognizance of offence under section 3 without the accused being committed to it for the trial. So what we look here is that uh, when the police completes the investigation, they file the charge sheet before the court. But the same terminology has not been used in here. Here the authority that is the investigating agency, meaning enforcement directorate, they will file the complaint before the special court. So when you look here, the authority needs to file. Who is this authority? We are referring to the authority as mentioned under section 48 that is the enforcement directorate. Now let us imagine that after the conclusion of trial if no offence of money laundering is being found to be committed then the uh, authority needs to file the closure report. Now coming to the next part of the provisions that are that imagine the scheduled offence has been tried is pending before court number A situated in jurisdiction A and the special court is situated in jurisdiction B. It would be impracticable to hold these two trials in court A and B when the trial of B depends upon the trial of A. So what will happen that this section 44 under clause C it authorizes that the case can be committed which case the case pertaining to the scheduled offence can be committed to the special court and from that stage the trial can be heard by the special court. You can read it here. Now this explanation again is very very important which has been added by 2019 Finance Act. Now it provides two important things that when we refer to these two trials as I stated on the previous slides that these are not joint trials but they are separate trials. Now what does this mean? Let us imagine that the person X has been acquitted in the scheduled offence. The question then arises whether the trial under the section 3 of the PMLA can still be continued. The answer is no. Why? Because the proceeds of crime are set to be generated, alleged to be generated from the commission of the scheduled offence. So if there is no scheduled offence, how can there be the offence of money laundering? So whenever there is acquittal in the scheduled offence, automatically the acquittal will also happen in the money laundering offence. Now when we look at the provisions of CRPC, sometimes we find that uh, the charge sheet has been filed but the investigation is still being carried on to collect the further evidences and then police can file supplementary charge sheet. Under the PMLA, we do not, under the PMLA, we did not have any such provision wherein once the ED has filed the complaint before the special court whether they can now file the supplementary complaint? The answer to that question is now in yes. Now look at explanation clause second. The complaint shall be deemed to include any subsequent complaint in respect of further investigation that may be conducted to bring any further evidence oral or documentary against any accused person involved in respect of the offence for which the complaint has been already filed whether named in the original complaint or not. So what is trying to tell you? Let us say in the original complaint person X's name did not come to the surface but when the ED was carrying forward the investigation it emerged that person X is also involved with person Y. So he needs to be also prosecuted. Now the ED can file this complaint in addition to the original complaint. 
Now coming to the last part of the discussion that is the bail provision which has been provided under section 45. Now this provision has been contentious and we will see why. Subsection 1 says notwithstanding anything contained in the code of criminal procedure, no person accused on of no person accused of an offence under this act shall be released on bail or on his own bond unless public prosecutor has been given an opportunity to oppose the bail application for such release or where the public prosecutor opposes such application of bail, the court is satisfied that there are reasonable grounds for believing that he is not guilty of such offence and that he is not likely to commit any offence while on bail. Now look at the look at the aesthetic marks that I have put in here. Now under this act have been substituted in the year 2018 for the phrase punishable for a term imprisonment for more than three years under part A of the schedule. Now this phrase has been deleted from the operating part of this phrase has been deleted from the operating part of subsection 1 after the judgment of Nikesh Tarachand Shah versus Union of India 2017 Supreme Court. Now if we look carefully, we see that the twin conditions of bail, those are the public prosecutor must be given an opportunity to oppose the bail application, second that court must have sufficient reason to believe that that person is not guilty of this offence, meaning there are no prima facie evidence available. So when courts were hearing these bail application under PMLA, it was relevant to, it is to be read in the context of the scheduled offence. So the application of judicial mind was for the offence of PMLA or it was for the offence of the scheduled offence which says that twin conditions would only be applicable for those offences which are punishable for more than three years. So what we have done here, we have created a class here that twin condition is only applicable to those people who have committed this scheduled offence which are punishable for more than three years. What was the basis of this classification? It was violating article 14 and 21 of the constitution. So the twin conditions in the context of right, this phrase punishable for a term of imprisonment for more than three years under part A of the schedule, it was struck down. Now after this judgment, the amendment was brought forth and this defect was cured by substituting this phrase with under this act. So now you are not making any classification that on what basis we are creating a group and only on this group twin conditions are to be applied. Now it is a uniform condition, now it is a uniform rule that these twin conditions are to be applicable to everyone. Now what is to be noted in here that when the court is hearing the bail applications matter, and court has to formulate this opinion that this person is not involved in money laundering. Months and months have been taken by the courts in going through 100 pages of evidences. Now what is happening in here, the court is actually putting in lot of time and effort in granting the bail, right? So it was then suggested the view is taken that why should not we quash the proceedings when the court is looking into the evidences to come to this conclusion that he is not guilty of such offence. So this has to be appreciated. Let's see what the time will tell us. Now section 50 talks about the summons to the persons. This section does not make any distinction whether the person has been called as a witness or he is being called as an offender. The person never gets to know and if you do not cooperate with the enforcement directorate when you are called by serving of the summons, this non-cooperation can be used against you. So we have made an attempt to holistically discuss all the provisions pertaining to the prevention of money laundering. Thank you.